Good morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, in the next uh, in the next 25 minutes, uh, I'm going to try to to present you what what is the, the COFAS global view of the of the global economy. Uh, and then, right after me, it's going to be a two-step presentation because my colleague Gregors will uh, will join and tell you how Polish companies can take profit from this uh, from this global environment. So let's try with uh, with a global view. If you think about it, since the starting of the year, um, two facts can be can be highlighted. Uh, the first one is, of course, political risk. It has already been said, but political risk in a lot of regions in the world, uh, emerging markets like Turkey, South Africa, in Europe, Western Europe, France, uh, still the UK, the US, uh, political risk is still at, at the top of the, of the agenda. But the paradox is, in the same time, if you look at economic indicators, business confidence is picking up. And if you try to link both, it's very difficult. Why businesses are more confident while political risk is, uh, is, uh, is, still, uh, is still very high? And this is, this, is a, this is, to tell you the truth, this is a really a puzzling question. So let's try to, to answer this question in this, in this presentation by starting with, uh, by starting with, uh, with, uh, with our global view on, on growth. As I said, since the starting of the year, perhaps the biggest surprise globally is a pickup in, in business confidence. You see here on the, on the right hand chart, uh, business confidence is really rising in all regions now in the world. The US, Western Europe, Brazil, China, almost everywhere, businesses are now much more confident. Why? Uh, because of plenty of reasons. If you look at it on, in Western Europe, for example, unemployment is going down. Uh, credit conditions for businesses uh, are very easy, very cheap, so it helps a lot. In China, uh, fiscal policy is much more expansionary than it used to be. And in the US, uh, a lot of people, I will go back to this in a few minutes, a lot of people are still expecting there are going to be a huge uh, and massive investment plan. So if you combine all of this, uh, if you combine all of this, business confidence uh, is, uh, is really picking up. And that, that's partly the reason why you see it on the left-hand chart. Uh, that's partly the reason why COFAS expects uh, a slight pickup in global growth this year. Uh, you, see it, uh, you see it on the, on the left. Mostly because of the improving situation in emerging markets, to tell you the truth. We think the worst has been passed in, uh, in countries like Brazil and, and Russia. Uh, that have been in, uh, in recession over the past two years. And if you combine all of this, uh, it brings you to, to this forecast, a slightly higher growth uh, this year, uh, despite uh, political risk, uh, as I said. So this is, this, is a key, this is a key puzzle and the key, uh, a big surprise. Since last, year, uh, since last year, there is clearly a disconnection between, on the one side, political uncertainties, and on the other side, what's going on on financial markets and what's going on uh, on the real economy. And you see it very clearly uh, on the, on the left-hand chart here. Until 2015, when political uncertainties were increasing, financial market volatility was increasing, was increasing as well. And since last year, this link doesn't work anymore. And, and it surprised everybody. So the key question is why now there is this kind of disconnection between on the one side political risk and on the other side what's going on on financial markets and what's going on on the real economy. I think the first answer is related to central banks. You know it very well, but in, in a lot of regions in the world, central banks have injected a lot of liquidity on markets and it helps, uh, in, it helps to, to mitigate uh, the volatility uh, resulting from, from political risk. So this is the first one. And the second one is even more simple. The second reason why there is this disconnection is even more simple. You see it on the right. It looks like, uh, it looks like financial markets are, are a little bit fed up with, uh, with political risk. So on the right, what we have, what we have showed is uh, all big uh, political events uh, in, in advanced economies uh, since uh, the Lehman crisis. So in the top, you see uh, all these events are related to, uh, to Greece, of course. And in the bottom, uh, you, 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 you remember what happened last year in the US, in the UK, and, and in Italy. And the trend is really crystal clear. I mean, at the beginning, when you had this kind of big political shock, it had a big impact on, uh, on financial market volatility. But 
then, uh, then it's, not, it's not true anymore. If you look in the bottom, uh, a political big shock now doesn't look like to have uh, a big impact on, on financial market volatility. And, and this is a key question, and this is a key unknown for 2017. We don't know if this disconnection between, on the one side, political risk, and on the other side, financial market and business confidence is going to continue or not. And, and, and this is a key risk, uh, of course, for, uh, for 2017. So when we, think about, uh, when we think about political uncertainties, first, of course, uh, we, we, we think about the US. As you know, right after the election of, uh, of Donald Trump in last November, uh, financial markets uh, got very positive, and they, tr they, they started to expect a huge and positive impact coming from a massive uh, investment plan uh, in the US. I think the key message I would like to highlight here is that these hopes will be disappointed at some point in 2017. And we start to realize it when you, when you hear about uh, what Donald Trump is saying since he has been elected. Clearly, clearly a, a massive uh, investment plan is not uh, in its top priority. His priority at the moment is to, uh, it's just to uh, cancel, to repeal uh, Obamacare, so the health care reform of the, of the former president, and it will take time. It will take time to negotiate a new reform with the US Congress, and so then, uh, if, uh, if, if it takes time, it means that in the best case scenario, you will be able to, uh, to, to put at the top of the agenda the question of, of uh, a fiscal stimulus uh, at, uh, no, uh, no, at the earliest, uh, in the later, much later this year, or even next year. So that's the reason why there have been a lot of expectations regarding uh, higher growth in the US this year. Uh, at COFAS, we're clearly below consensus, and we think, uh, we think these hopes will be a little bit disappointed this year. And the second reason why we are a little bit more cautious than, uh, than many other people in the US, it's because of uh, what you see on the, on the chart behind me. Let's forget one moment what's going on uh, on the government side in the US. If you look only at the cyclical development of the US economy, the peak is clearly behind us. And you see it if you look at cyclical indicators in the automotive sector, in the construction sector. We have been used to see five to six percent growth in the automotive sector over the past years, but it's not gonna last. It's not going to last because now the car sales have recovered their pre-crisis level in the US, so the catch-up process is over. The same on the construction sector. So all in all, we are not very pessimistic, but don't expect a huge and a very high uh, growth rate uh, in the US uh, in, the, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming quarters. So that's the key message regarding, regarding the US. Uh, the message on the UK is a, is a little bit similar. Let's forget one moment what's going on at political side. Uh, you know, next week, uh, finally, Article 50 will be, uh, will be started in the, in the UK. So it means that in a period of time of two years, uh, the UK is likely to, to exit the European Union. But just, uh, I will not focus, I don't have time, so I will not focus on long-term prospect of the, of the UK economy. But in the very short term, I think the key topic in the UK is really the lagged impact coming from uh, higher inflation and coming from the, the depreciation of the, of the, of the currency uh, over the past quarters. On the one side, the lower, the lower currency will have some positive, uh, some positive effects, especially on exports. Uh, you see it on the, on the left-hand chart. But if you look at the situation very carefully in the UK, the problem is that uh, a lot, uh, not, not a lot of sectors will benefit from, uh, from lower currency perhaps the pharmaceutical sector, uh, the automotive sector a little bit as well. But on the other side, a lot of other sectors will suffer from uh, higher inflation. So basically, whole private consumption related sectors uh, will suffer from that. Uh, for example, the retail sector you see on the, on the top. And some of the ones will also suffer from higher import costs uh, related to the, to the lower currency. Uh, here, I'm thinking about the, the construction sector. So all in all, you see in the, in the short term, the picture is clearly mixed uh, in the UK. We expect growth uh, to slow, but to remain at a, at a, at a quite moderate level uh, this year in, uh, in the UK. 
So all in all, when you combine all of this, you will not be surprised to see on the left-hand chart that we expect uh, an increase in business insolvencies in the, in the UK this year. Uh, the same in the US, but they start for, it starts from a very low level, but we expect a, a small magnitude increase in, in business insolvencies. In the Eurozone, the situation is a little bit different. I mean, business insolvencies uh, will continue to, to decrease uh, in the coming months in most countries in the Eurozone for a very simple reason. The recovery process has started much later than in the UK or, is, or in the US, so the catch-up process is not over. So business insolvencies are still much higher than they used to be before the crisis, so there is still plenty of, plenty of room for, uh, for catch-up and plenty of room for uh, a, decrease tr a decreasing trend in, uh, in, uh, in business insolvencies. Of course, this is based on the assumption that there will not be any big political shock in the coming weeks uh, or months in, uh, in, in, in the Eurozone. So another way to look at uh, our global view uh, at COFAS is uh, this sector risk assessment. So this is, uh, this is a very simple way to measure uh, credit risk uh, of, uh, of companies in a given sector and in a given region. So to do so, uh, of course, we take into account our payment experience at COFAS. We also take into account a very large number of uh, financial indicators uh, than we can get from, from listed companies. And we also take into account uh, the expertise uh, of, uh, and the knowledge of our experts, uh, our underwriters uh, at, at COFAS. And when we combine all of this, you get this uh, four grade scale from a very low risk uh, in, uh, in green to very high risk uh, in, uh, in, uh, in deep red. And so what does it tell you? You see the situation at, at, uh, at global level. So for example, look at uh, Central and Eastern Europe. You don't see any, uh, any sector in, uh, in, uh, in deep red, meaning that uh, this, uh, no sector is, uh, is in a very high risk. If you compare Central and Eastern Europe with other regions uh, in the world, uh, this is clearly one of the regions where the situation is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, better at the moment. Having said this, you see, you see a different uh, outlook from one sector to another. The automotive sector, for example, is, uh, is, uh, is still benefiting from, uh, uh, from the positive outlook uh, in, in Western Europe in this, uh, in this sector. But on the other side, you see some other segments, some other sectors here in red metals, energy, uh, because of global factors, of course, and the construction sector, uh, which is perhaps uh, the key weakness in the, in the region uh, at the moment. Elsewhere in the world, uh, you see very recently, we update these uh, this assessments on a quarterly basis, and you see that recently we have upgraded, uh, we have upgraded uh, a couple of sectors, especially in Latin America, construction, energy, metals, especially because of the improving situation uh, in, in Brazil. So they stay in high risk, but they are, they are not in a, in a very high risk anymore. So it's better than it used to be. And the same in emerging Asia, where we are upgrading uh, the, metal, the metal sector in China. And all in all, uh, it, uh, it explains you uh, why uh, that we, 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 we see uh, there are still plenty of problems regarding overcapacity there, but the situation is improving a little bit with global prices uh, increasing. So this is, uh, I think this is a key message regarding, uh, regarding emerging markets. Uh, if now you look at the situation, not from a credit risk standpoint, but more from a, from a growth standpoint, uh, the picture uh, is quite the same. Uh, here on the y-axis, you see, uh, you see the, the growth forecast on a sector-by-sector -sector basis uh, for emerging markets as a whole. And, and if you look at the x-axis, it shows you uh, the growth gap between 2017 on the one side and 2016 on the other side. On the other hand, so all in all, it means that if you're on the top right part of the chart, it means that growth is expected to be high, and it's expected to be higher than it used to be last year. And all in all, it's a good summary of what's going on in emerging markets as a, as a whole. If you look in green, uh, our forecast, our GDP growth forecast for emerging markets as a whole is better than it used to be last year. 
Just as a reminder, GDP growth has been divided by two in emerging markets between 2010 and, 2000 and 2015. So now it's going to be a little bit better, not as good as it used to be uh, five years ago, but at least uh, it, it means that the worst has been passed. And now if you look at the situation on a, on a sector by sector basis, you see on the top, uh, we are still pretty positive on, on sectors like the pharmaceutical one, like uh, retail, the automotive one, and so on. In other words, all sectors related to, uh, to, uh, to, the, emerging, uh, to the emerging middle class in a lot of, uh, of emerging market regions. So, the situation is clearly improving in emerging markets. Having said this, we also want to highlight here that there are two big risks uh, at the moment in emerging markets. The first one uh, is related to corporate debt. Corporate debt has increased very significantly uh, over the past years uh, in emerging markets. It has been multiplied by four and a half over the past 10 years. So this is huge. And if you look at the situation of the very recent situation on the, on the left, corporate debt keeps increasing in a lot of emerging markets. Not in all emerging markets, but in a lot of, of emerging markets. And the key risk at the moment is clearly related to the negative feedback loop between on the one side corporate debt and on the other side, what's going on in the banking sector in a lot of emerging markets. Why? Because a too high and excessive corporate debt in emerging, in emerging markets leads to uh, higher uh, non-performing loans, bad loans uh, in, uh, in a lot of banks in, uh, in emerging markets. And so the problem is then banks tend to tighten their credit conditions. And this is what you see on the, on the right hand chart here. This is the outcome of a quarterly survey which is made by the Institute of International Finance in all, uh, all emerging market regions. And on a quarterly basis, they ask the same questions and they ask to banks, do you tighten or do you ease credit conditions uh, in, uh, in your region at the moment? And when the score is below 50, it means that banks are saying we are tightening credit conditions. When it's above 50, they're saying we're easing credit conditions. So it looks like you, you, you're in the lucky part of the world, as you can see. Central and Eastern Europe uh, is not impacted by uh, tighter credit conditions, according to this survey. But in all, other, in all other regions, you see them in the bottom, it means that uh, banks are saying they are tightening credit conditions. And so that's a key risk for a lot of corporates in 2017. They are over-indebted and they have to face tighter credit conditions coming from, from banks, especially in the Middle East, especially in Africa, and especially in, uh, in, in Latin America. So when we talk about corporate debt, you see one small country in the top of the, of the chart uh, in the, on, the, on, the, on the left, which is, which is China. So if you look at the news, it's, it's very puzzling because it looks like uh, China's economy is, uh, is not slowing anymore. The situation is okay, is under control. Uh, growth is stabilizing in, in China. And, and it's true. If you look at basic indicators like GDP growth, industrial production, uh, retail sales, it looks like the situation is okay. The problem is that the, situa is the situation seems under control at the surface only because of uh, higher fiscal spending coming for, from the government. And this kind of reply, uh, this kind of response is clearly not sustainable as fiscal deficit uh, is higher and higher in, in China. Uh, a lot of uh, local states are more and more uh, indebted. And the problem is that uh, now local banks are supporting, have to support all economic agents in China. They have to support the government, they have to support uh, not only the central government, but also local, local states. They have to support large companies that are over indebted. And we start to see uh, uh, tighter credit conditions coming from banks and rising bad loans. So this is, uh, this is clearly a key, uh, a key question and a key uncertainty for 2017 and 2018. The second risk is on the financial side. Right after the Lehman crisis, the central bank in China injected a lot of liquidity uh, in, in, the, in, the Chinese, uh, in the Chinese economy. And the, uh, the problem is that uh, almost a decade later, this huge pocket of liquidity 
is moving from one asset to another, and it's creating a lot of volatility and a lot of risk. You see it on, the, on, on, the this, on this chart. It started with what went on on stock, on stock markets uh, in, the, in the summer 2015. You remember what happened? There were a lot of uh, titles in the news regarding uh, a stock, uh, stock market crash uh, in China. The process was very simple. I mean, because of its huge available li liquidity, a lot of investors bought stocks in China. Prices went up, and at one point, the authorities got scared, and they decided to tighten regulations. And the outcome was a lot of investors got panicked, and they decided to move their liquidity from this asset class to another one, and then to another one, uh, the bond market, and then to another one, uh, the real estate sector. And every time, the process is the same. All investors go into the same class. They buy the same type of assets. Prices go up. And at one point, authorities decide to tighten the regulation, and it creates a lot of panic. And so far, it works, more or less. But at one point, we have to keep in mind the transition process between one asset class to another could not work. And it could uh, create a, a, a burst and a, kind of, uh, and a kind of crisis. The problem is that, as an economist, I can't tell you when it happens. I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow. I don't know if it's going to be one month from now or only two years or three years from now. But this is a key risk to, to, to have in mind. So I told you a few minutes ago that, OK, we have to, to, to have in mind really two big risks in emerging markets. The first one is corporate debt. And unsurprisingly, the second one is uh, what's going on at political level. So at the moment, we only talk about uh, Europe, the US, regarding political risk. But don't forget, there are still plenty of political uncertainties in, uh, in, in emerging markets, in Turkey, in South Africa, uh, in Latin America as well, in a lot of countries in, uh, uh, in Africa. And really, to, to better quantify what's going on at political level, uh, COFAS has just released a new political risk index that takes into account all dimensions of uh, political risk. So the first one is uh, a, new, uh, a new, new set of indicators that makes it possible for us to look very carefully at what's going on uh, regarding uh, conflict risk. Uh, you, see it on the, you see it in the bottom. Because, uh, of course, when uh, there are a lot of conflicts, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a risk for businesses, basically, which uh, cannot even produce. Look at what happened in, in Ukraine uh, a couple of years ago. Then we, have also, we are also looking very carefully at, at what's going on uh, internally in each country. Because in a lot of countries, we're seeing more and more that social frustration is, is arising. Uh, because of lower, uh, higher, higher unemployment, higher inf inflation, higher income inequalities because of the crisis. And when you combine all of this, you can get what you see on the top, uh, political and social fragility risk. You can, you can get uh, a good idea of what's going on and, and, uh, at, uh, in the, at the internal level and what could impact businesses who could, who could get uh, less confident. And in the middle, you see, uh, you see the red bubble. We have also uh, looked at a, a large number of indicators that make it possible to, uh, to measure, to better quantify uh, terrorism risk. Because basically, you know this is, uh, this is more and more an issue in more and more countries uh, around, around the world. So we put it separately because in some cases, terrorism risk, it's a little bit like, uh, like a war or conflict risk. When uh, terrorism is very high, it's very similar to the effect of a war on, on businesses. Businesses can't even produce, can't even do their, uh, their, their business. On some other cases, and this is, for example, the case in, uh, in Western Europe, uh, when there are some terrorism attacks, uh, it has an impact on business confidence. So then the, the impact is more similar to uh, social risk we see on the top. So all in all, when you combine all these three, three types of political risk, conflict, terrorism, and social risk, you get, you get this, uh, this political risk indicators, indicator. You see it here on a, on a, re, on a region by region basis. And clearly, the picture is quite crystal clear. I mean, political risk uh, is increasing everywhere. 
So it's increasing everywhere because uh, the number of conflicts globally uh, has increased twofold uh, since 2007. The number of terrorist attacks has, has been multiplied by three over the past 10 years as well. And if you look at the situation uh, at the social level, uh, because of the Lehman crisis and because of, uh, of, uh, of a lot of economic crisis in a lot of emerging market regions, social frustration is, is arising uh, as well. Then, of course, the situation is very different from one country and from one region to, to, to another. Uh, CIS, CIS, CIS countries uh, see uh, the situation in terms of risk is really deteriorating regarding, uh, regarding politics. Uh, the same, of course, it's less surprising for Middle East and, and, and North Africa. And on the other side, you see in Europe, it looks like if you look at this very aggregated index, the situation is more under control. But here, you have also to keep in mind that this is really uh, an aggregate index. So for, for European Union, uh, you see risks looks much less elevated. But it's because if you, if you take into account, of course, the conflict risk and so on, it's very low uh, in our countries in, in Europe. But if you look at the situation more into detail, uh, in, if you give more, more weight to what's going on at internal level, then you would see, uh, then you would see the situation is, uh, is deteriorating there, uh, there as well. So you can look on our, on our website if you want to find this, uh, this paper that has been released uh, a, couple of, a couple of days ago. And finally, and it will be my final word, uh, by some people, uh, protectionism risk is also seen as a, as a political risk. So again, uh, I go back to the US. You know uh, there are a lot of concerns at the moment globally regarding uh, the coming trade policy uh, in, in the US. We have tried to look at, uh, at the situation on a country by country basis. You see it on the, on the left hand chart. And to see what country in the world could be uh, most affected in case of, uh, of uh, uh, very tight protectionist measures coming from, from the US. And you see the situation. We have looked at uh, exports of each country to the US as a percentage of GDP. And we have, we have made a distinction between commodity exports and manufactured export products because, uh, as you know, uh, the US is more uh, inclined to decide protectionist measures regarding the automotive sector, regarding the electronic sector, so manufactured products, than uh, concerning, uh, concerning commodities. And if you look at the situation, countries that are most at risk, unsurprisingly, are in Central America, so like Mexico and some other smaller countries. Then it's a little bit more surprising that in Latin America, uh, Brazil and other countries don't look much exposed because they, they export mostly commodities and they have diversified over the past decades their, uh, their, 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 their markets. They export more to Asia now than to the US. And surprisingly, some, some Asian countries are, are really at risk as well. You see, you see them uh, on the chart. So I've not even put uh, Poland and some of the Central Eastern Europe countries because figures are so low then it, it means that uh, your countries, uh, countries in the region are not at risk at all regarding, uh, regarding this protectionism risk coming, uh, coming from the US. So all in all, providing that there is no big shock regarding the trade policy in the US, the good news is regarding, uh, regarding trade gro global trade growth, you see it on the, on the right hand chart, is that we expect a small pickup in, in global exports uh, this year. So this is based on the assumption that, of course, business confidence is going up. Uh, oil prices go up a little bit uh, as well. All commodity prices are, are a bit higher than it used to be last year. And finally, it's a good summary of our global view. The situation is improving a little bit. We're still far away from the normal we were used to see before the crisis. But this small magnitude improvement is really dependent and reliant on what's going on at political level at the moment. Thank you.